So my name is, as was mentioned, Kamilov Czarek, and some of you might remember me from, well, yesterday. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about ACA versus Spark in big data systems, the match to the death. Uh, but seriously, the idea is that for most of the time, despite what you might think that Spark is big data and ACA totally isn't, uh, both are actually quite useful in different big data cases. So I'll try to highlight them that and uh, show how you can kind of connect them together to suit the needs of your particular system. And just a disclaimer. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm doing a lot of disclaimers now. This is based on my personal experiences while designing and developing such systems. So you might have different impressions. Please don't judge me. <laughs> And let's start with what things are, because that will actually come into play. So according to Wikipedia, Apache Spark is an open source cluster computing framework. And that it is. It's basically all focused on cluster computing. It's one of the most popular frameworks of that type. And it has the modules that most of us, I guess, know, like SQL for processing big data with SQL queries, GraphX for graphic, graph, analy sorry, graph analytics. Uh, Spark ML or MLLeap for machine learning and the infamous streaming module. And ACA, on the other hand, according to Wikipedia, is, and I quote here, a free and open source toolkit and runtime simplifying the construction of concurrent and distributed applications on the JVM. So uh, based on that definition, I don't really know what ACA is, but we know that in practice, right? It's a toolkit which started with actors for uh, parallel processing, and then other modules were born like the streaming module, HTTP client and server, the cluster for running actors in distributed systems, even source persistence, and the newcomer Alpaca, which is essentially integration on ACA streams. And now the ultimate question, what is big data? Now, according again to Wikipedia, no one really knows what big data is because there is like a ton of definitions that are competing. But the one that I particularly like and I think is suitable for that presentation is this is a type of data, this is a volume or velocity of data that you could not process it with your traditional applications and you need data-centric software to do this. Meaning, for instance, if uh, you uh, took a very large quantity of data on, or data that is arriving really fast and you try to put it in your typical Spring application and put it then in your typical Oracle database, what will happen is uh, either the data will arrive so late that it will basically be in a, will not be of value anymore or maybe the whole application will break because, you know, not enough resources or not resources not used well enough. And that means that we need to apply software that is specifically designed to handle fast or big data to be able to process it. And now most of you might think that big data is basically, you know, taking data from, uh, let's say, one HDFS folder, putting it in Spark and spewing it out to another HDFS folder, but big data systems actually have many faces. And while transformations are certainly one of them, there are other things that we need to consider while building them. First up, ingestion. We need to collect the data from different data sources and get it into our system. Then we probably need to do some consideration as to how they're stored, where they're stored, which formats, how do we design data models. Uh, while doing the transformations on that, we also need to take care of how transformations relate to each other. If we have multiple transformations, 10, 20, 40 of them in one system, so that will be orchestration and process control. And finally, when the data is transformed to the correct, correct uh, form, uh, you might want to do extraction. So basically take the data and ship it to your client in the format that the client wants, right? And what I'll do in this presentation is I will go through each of these co typical concerns in big data systems, and I will try to show cases for ACA and Spark in almost each one of them. So starting from the beginning, we get data ingestion, which is a fancy way of saying shipping data from different sources to your system. And the characteristic thing in big data is that we have a multitude of sources. Each system pretty much collects from things like files, relational databases, some NoSQL databases, messaging systems like JMS or Kafka, maybe TCP sockets, you have to call some HTTP uh, services, and you need to land it all into something that's called the landing area. It may be like a HDFS cluster, a folder on your HDFS cluster, or uh, tables in a Cassandra cluster, for instance. And while doing it, two things 
usually tend to happen. One is you might want to do some buffering because the amount of data you're collecting is too high. And the other one is you might want to do some pre-processing while ingesting data. For instance, in my business, which is med medical data, basically, uh, it, there is a high concern that you need to make data 100% anonymous because there is like crazy legal requirements on that. So in the ingestion process, some pre-processing that normally occurs. And some of you might ask why I'm even talking about this since you're not going to be doing ingestion on Sp in Spark or Akka because you have all these like Pokemon named uh, ingestors, right? In on Cloudera or on in other environments like Scoop, Flume, NiFi, Logstash. Well, my suggestion, first suggestion is don't do that. <laughs> don't use them. And uh, on your uh, right-hand side, you can see a code that imports some quite simple data in Scoop, and that's not even an incremental import, right? In comparison to on your left-hand side, you have the code that does the same thing with Akka Streams. And the comparison and to which is shorter and which is more readable is obvious, I guess. Most of these tools, they use quite alien lingos, which are specific to that one tool only. And these are quite complicated. They are configured in strings mostly. This is extremely error prone. And myself, I really prefer to do, if possible, to do ingestion in the normal frameworks in compiled and statically typed languages. And to enforce that point, here is a example flume flow. And on the other side, you can see what I can see when I look at it. Um, yeah, so now that we know that we'll be doing our ingestion in Spark or Akka, let's see what sources and things they can both handle. And you can see in the, that the middle part of the graph is what both Spark and Akka can handle. This is actually quite a lot. We have relation, relational databases, files, TCP, Kafka, so on. So most of it is common, and if your source and sync land in that area, that means you can pretty much choose either one of them, depending on other criteria. But there is one huge difference. So Spark can handle HDFS, especially as the landing area, whereas Akka has very little HDFS integration. So if your data has to, or for the data for your system or part of the system has to be stored into HDFS, then for ingestion and possibly processing, you're stuck with Spark. Akka, on the other hand, has great HTTP and JMS integration, which Spark doesn't have. You can theoretically implement it at, by hand in streams, but I wouldn't advise you to do that, especially for JMS, because it isn't that simple. So that is the kind of liberty we enjoy with each one of them in terms of sources and things. And now, we've, I've talked a lot about NoSQL and Kafka and stuff, but what you're actually likely to gonna be doing in big data projects is, you know, you're gonna be importing a lot of data from Oracle, right? Huge data sets from Oracle, that Oracle that's like, you do that most of the time, right? And that poses a problem because large data sets, you need to get them through the ingestion process somehow. And Akka and Spark have kind of uh, two different ways of doing it, really. So Akka streams, when done correctly, can be reactive. With uh, relational databases, you should probably use uh, reactive drivers from Slick to do that and then publish into a stream. And uh, that, enables you do, that enables you to do one thing, which is very specific, that you can take a small amount of resources, one or two nodes, start these streams from the database to your landing area, and you'll get back pressure with that, meaning that if, for instance, we have a lot of time, we have quite a lot of time, uh, these streams will run smoothly, and they will run with that back pressure. They will adjust to your... Uh, lending area possibilities of consumption until the whole data gets through. Now Spark, for instance, doesn't do that, right? Because in Spark, Spark isn't reactive, though watch out because this feature is actually being developed. There is like a Jira and you can see a progress on it on like reactive Spark streams. But I don't know with which versions that's gonna ship. Uh, so what you do to unburden yourself when loading massive amounts of data is you do a partitioned import as uh, shown here with this small snippet of code. Uh, that means that Spark will essentially assign a number of workers to be implementing that data from these bounds in parallel, right? And what you can do then with Spark is to essentially, and that's a common pattern with Spark, you can throw resources at it, right? meaning that you can add and add workers with more and more memory and processing power. That will mean more partition, and you will be importing data massively in parallel. 
so you will get a very high throughput. So depending on the situation that you have, for instance, whether you have a lot of resources, typically not because resources are mostly thrown at transformations, not at ingestion, you might, in resource scarcity, you might use ACCA to run a back pressure flow that will eventually import oil data, or you can, for instance, use Spark to throw resources at it and do it in a massively parallel way. And now that we've more or less ingested the data into the system, let's go into data transformation, which is again an umbrella term for many types of things you can do, from things like exploratory analysis to you know, advanced stuff like machine learning, right? And first up, exploratory analysis, which is essentially getting to know your data. Because you can assume that the data has some structure, has some fields, but in practice you will find a lot of that is missing or it doesn't really have the value, something should be an int, it's actually a string, etc., etc. So you need to go there first, you need to investigate what the data really is and probably from that will result some procedures to correct the data before you do further processing or some more advanced analytics. And ACCA, as it is, again, not a typical, it's not a framework aimed at big data, it just has some nice features that are useful in distributed systems and big data. It doesn't really support exploratory analysis per se, it doesn't have any tools. It's possible to do it, but I haven't really seen anyone doing exploratory analysis with ACCA. Spark, on the other hand, it has the REPL for uh, ad hoc computations. You have data frames, which make almost no assumptions about what data is behind them. So you can first load that data and then experiment with it to recognize the structure. You have these little helper methods like show, describe, and explain, which produce, can produce statistics like you see on the screen. And uh, you have the SQL interface, which is also you know, fitting, right? And you, just one disclaimer, that's probably not gonna happen in Scala if it's done by your data analyst or your data scientist, right? It's probably gonna be R or Python, but again, Spark supports it. And once we've explored the data, we can do you know, the actual processing, batch or stream processing. And here you have a small comparison, which I think is pretty obvious between the two, meaning ACCA has streams. ACCA can also do batching if your streams are essentially finite and you run them over and over. That's just batches, right? Uh, but it is geared way, to, way more towards uh, reactive processing, towards having very low latency, uh, whereas Spark doesn't run actual streaming, even Spark streaming is of course micro batches, which means that the application wakes up with some frequency and checks its sources. If it has data there, it starts running over and over, right? And that, you know, the whole process means that it has way higher latency than ACCA, even the streaming part. However, again, Spark is cluster computing. So you have always the possibility to just throw resources at it and achieve a very high throughput. With ACCA streams, you could achieve very high throughput, but you will have to do way more legwork to actually make that happen in comparison to Spark. So the verdict is that for streaming, if your case is streaming data with very low latency, that would be probably ACCA. Uh, if you can, t you have massive streams that need to run in parallel and you can tolerate uh, some latency uh, and get some more throughput, then maybe Spark. Patch computations, mostly Spark really. But there is another case that I wanted to mention, which is maybe less obvious than the last one. And that's that, no, that is that not all computations really work that well with uh, collection-based APIs, which is ACCA streams and which is Spark, right? Imagine uh, the situation that my friend uh, once uh, brought up to me, uh, where they need to, uh, essentially they have quite a lot of data on which they need to run graph analytics. But it has to be with very low latency. So Spark and Spark streamings are out of the way because they cannot provide such a low latency. Now, you could try to do that with ACCA streams, but streaming and graph analytics are very different abstractions. So it will be very, very hard to do this. And I haven't really heard of a framework which combines you know, ACCA streams with graph processing. Uh, so what they decided to do is decided to go one step back and actually use ACCA actors to implement it because with all their faults that we dislike about actors, uh, there's still a very neat, very object-oriented abstraction which is very easy to understand and implement pretty much any calculations on. So they decided to implement this uh, low latency processing on ACCA actors and then when they needed to scale it out, they installed it on ACCA cluster. That of course has the downside of having to care about things like cluster convergence and split-brain scenarios, 
but these were described to us, how to handle to us by our friends at this edition of Scholar and the former one. So this is an alternative. Some computations by their nature you don't really want to do either in ACA streams or in Spark because this is just easier to understand them if, they, if you, for instance, do it with actors, right? And the word of the day, machine learning, right? Machine learning, as I guess my workshop proved yesterday, is a cool and hip word that everyone wants to hear, but not everyone likes to actually do it because sometimes it's getting kind of tedious, the math behind it is very complicated, etc. So what you really want as a developer is to have a nice framework which has a neat interface, and behind that interface you have hidden all the complexities in a black box, right? You just throw your data at it and it works. And that time, of course, what I'm describing is Spark ML, right? This is the type of API that Spark provides. It is very good in terms of being simple to use, and it's quite performant in batch processing, but it offers little to none options in terms of streaming ML, actually. It has just a few streaming processors, and uh, most of uh, algorithms are not available for streaming. Like yesterday, they asked me a question, how can I do uh, gradient boosted trees with Spark streaming? The answer is you can't. So maybe Akka then. Well, Akka is of course very great for streaming, but it doesn't really have any kind of framework which would work like Spark ML that will be very, very easy to use. There are some good examples as to how you yourself can implement these algorithms, and these are the samples from the underscore IO page, which I highly recommend. And there's the Akka online product, uh, project for Akka uh, ma reactive machine learning, which was developed by our friend Jan Postelnik here, called GoSub PL on GitHub. So if you ever find yourself in such a situation, I suggest you check that out. And finally, okay, we've ingested the data, we've done, we're doing the processing. And we have to introduce some order because the number of the transformations is getting high. We have 20, 30, 50 transformations. And we need to introduce order before we lose track of what's happening in the system. And that would be process orchestration, broadly speaking. Uh, what you need to do is you need to first resolve data set relationships or dependencies between the transformations. Because if you have a large system which works on some domain, you will get transformations that work on related data. One uses the output of some other as its input, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, then you need to coordinate these components to tell them, for instance, to work in sequence or to start from some kind of cron. And finally, you need to take care of some availability issues. For instance, if a transformation is supposed to run but the component is not available, maybe you can wait for it to you know, come back up and then tell it to run later or to run when it's up. And when considering that, please remember that not all data in big data systems is actually big data as per definition given in the beginning. Meaning that you have the data flow where you are very likely to process the uh, analytically large quantities of data, right? Massive data sets, but to control the system itself you don't need tools that can handle massive amounts of data because you just send small commands between the components, right? And so how orchestration can be done, there are two ways. One is basically the ad hoc mode, which means that you don't really do orchestration like this, like normally, you just have each component take care of its own stuff. For instance, when you launch a transformation, it checks uh, what data it needs, whether it has these data sets. If yes, it runs. If no, it reports failure somewhere, right? And this is a very simple model that you're likely to start your project with, because people don't really think about orchestration in big data systems that much. Uh, it's simple, but it, ha it doesn't risk global failure in terms of if one of the transformations fails, then it may affect one or two related transformations, but the rest of the system still works, right? Uh, yeah, that's true until your system grows complex. And when it does, you will end up with what you can essentially hear, see here, which is a big ball of mud. One transformation failed, didn't produce a data set, then the other didn't start because there was no data set, then the other shouldn't start but actually started without any data set, it failed, etc., etc. And this type of failure is very hard to trace if you're only doing ad hoc orchestration in every component. Uh, apart from the others. So then you're probably going to transfer to something which you can call coordinated mode of orchestration, which is that you have one central logic, maybe a process description from which the whole system is run, instead of just every component running its own data sets. And you will be doing global data set uh, dependency resolution here, so we will resolve the relationships for all the components, 
However, what you cannot do in, in that type of orchestration is your orchestration can never fail because this is the central brain of your system right now. If it dies, then the whole system is essentially defunct. So we need to make sure that if we have one instance of the orchestrator, it fails, there will be some other instance that will step up and take up the work all the time, right? And myself, in practice, I did that kind, kind of in ACTA cluster, and I think it's a good solution for introducing a central kind of centralized orchestrator for your system. Because it's clustered, you can provision high availability, you can duplicate your actors so that if one instance becomes dead, then some other instance on some other node will step up and continue the work, and your system essentially is working 100% of the time. It supports distributed messaging. You can handle failures of individual components, and the system is pretty self-healing. However, of course, still there are downsides. You need to design very carefully because uh, you need to consider things like sending messages between different nodes of the cluster, disseminating the uh, distributed messaging in the cluster. You are susceptible to split-brain scenarios, and you need to think what role does convergence play the orchestration convergence plays in the system. What happens, for instance, if the part of the system, you know, partitions in the network? Should it work standal as a standalone system? Or maybe it should be downed. These types of situations. Okay, so we have essentially run through uh, importing the data. We have transformed the data that was neatly orchestrated, and now we need to do extraction, ship the data to the client, right? And things that you need to consider here is you have multiple storages and storage format. And again, HDFS, you're pretty much stuck with Spark, right? Uh, some things like Cassandra, for instance, you can maybe ship the data with Spark there and then ship it out with Akka to your client, which might be beneficial for you. And most of the time, your clients will probably ask you to actually return this data in multiple formats, meaning one data set, they probably need to be able to filter it, add some lenses to it, change the format in which they want that exported. But the most crucial thing, from my perspective, is the size of the extract. And keep in mind that the size of the extract is not really that much tied to the size of the data beforehand. Meaning you could have had a massive data set while processing it, but you did some heavy aggregations on it, and it re resulted in a small data set at the extract level. So if your mo extracts are modestly sized, then you could, for instance, risk using ACK HTTP to expose this via some microservices, right? Because HTTP interfaces are neat both for human use and for uh, use by other applications. However, you might end up in a situation doing things like my company basically does, where we don't sell the final results of the analysis, but we sell pre-processed data. So the extract that we provide to the clients are still massive chunks of really big data. And in that case, you mostly wound up in a Spark territory because you need to process this massive amount of data in parallel, for instance, doing cluster to cluster migration of data. And okay, so I think I have went through most of the scenarios on most of the concerns. And let's start to ra start wrapping it up. So this might be a kind of you know architecture and environment in which Akka and its components would fare best for data, right? This is mostly concerns itself with streaming, and the main need is to deliver ship the data fast. The extracts are pretty small, concise, so we can expose them via HTTP. For orchestration, of course, I suggest Akka cluster. Spark, on the other hand, would fare best in this kind of uh, architecture, where you would use mostly HDFS or some batch-friendly kind of storage, and you will generally ingest and process data sets which are really huge, mostly type of batch processing, and you would spew out very large extracts. But in reality, you're most likely to be working on creating this kind of system, which is essentially it encompasses it all. You have the very different ingestion sources. Some of the data needs to be streamed, while the other needs to be batched. Some is more focused on you know, f fast delivery of the data. Some are focused on uh, high throughput and uh, doing massive exports, right? So I hope that with that presentation, I've given you some idea as to on each of the stages how to apply both uh, Spark and Akka and how that make out for you in creating such systems. Thank you very much. <laughs>